Hello everyone, I'm Kelly from 1-800-RESPECT and welcome to today's webinar. Before we start, I would like to pay our respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this meeting takes place and also pay our respect to elders both past and present. Today's topic is forced marriage, understanding context and connecting to services. Frontline workers are often best placed to recognise indicators, identify vulnerable people and link them to appropriate support services. We're pleased to welcome our presenter for today, Jennifer Byrne. Jennifer is Director, Anti-Slavery Australia and Associate Professor, UTS Faculty of Law. Anti-Slavery Anti Australia is the only university-based law and research centre in Australia dedicated to advancing the rights of people who have experienced human trafficking and extreme forms of exploitation by providing access to legal advice and representation for trafficked and enslaved people in Australia. The law practice currently assists over 70 clients with a wide range of legal issues, including representation for those in or facing forced marriage, migration matters, or housing and other issues. Jennifer Byrne is a member of the National Roundtable on Human Trafficking and Slavery, a frequent media com commentator, and a practicing lawyer and migration agent. Please note this webinar is live and interactive. You're encouraged to participate by posing questions to Jennifer, which can be typed into the chat box, which is located at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. There will be approximately 10 minutes at the end of the webinar for question and answer time. Jennifer will attempt to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. And should your question not be answered during the webinar, Jennifer is happy to be contacted via email afterwards at jennifer.byrne at uts.edu.au. If you're experiencing any difficulty hearing the sound during the webinar, please dial the 1800 support number listed in the chat box. I'm now very pleased to pass over to Jennifer to begin today's webinar. Thank you, Kelly. It's uh, terrific to be here with you all uh, to discuss this important and emerging issue of forced marriage in Australia. And we're going to go straight to the slides. Thank you. I'd like to begin by firstly speaking a bit about the work of Anti-Slavery Australia and explain why an organisation like us is involved in this space. One of the first things to note is that best factors responses to forced marriage are still developing. And there are a number of key organisations involved in developing these responses. And we'd like to involve as many organisations as possible in this discussion. I'd like to um, begin um, by remembering to um, change the slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, to, to speak about um, the context of forced marriage in Australia, to speak about forced marriage law, the criminalisation of forced marriage as an offence, and to talk about some of the indicators of forced marriage and the effect of forced marriage on survivors. Our task, I think, is to uh, develop uh, best practice responses to forced marriage, and this is part of an emerging discussion. So the organisations that are involved um, in, in this discussion you know, include um, 1800 Respect, the Australian Red Cross, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commission, Australian Muslim Women's Centre for Human Rights, Salvation Army, Legal Aid, Community Law Centres, as well as the Australian Government and State and Territory Governments. Importantly, in New South Wales and Victoria, uh, the Red Cross and Anti-Slavery Australia have convened um, with communities uh, forced marriage networks. And we'd uh, encourage you to connect with, with these networks if you'd like to continue your participation in, in developing best practice responses to, uh, to forced marriage in Australia. This is um, just locating um, within, a, in, within a table um, Anti-Slavery Australia's approach to this issue. And at the very centre of this table, you'll see that we have 
research and advocacy. We are based in a university and we do prioritise um, evidence based, you know, developing a, a, a strong response based on research and evidence. And that's why um, you know, we draw on uh, research that's been produced by academics, um, by the Australian Institute of Criminology and other organisations to, to frame and develop this response. We've learnt a lot by um, observing and reading about international best practice particularly in the UK, which has had a uh, long um, involvement in, in developing responses to, to forced marriage. But our, our, our task and our collective task is to think about the, the human rights and the needs of the person affected by forced marriage and to put them at the centre of any response that's developed to either uh, prevent forced marriage or to uh, you know, provide support and protection to survivors. I'd like uh, now to make a couple of comments uh, about forced marriage uh, within the international and the Australian context and begin by, by referring to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which says quite clearly that marriage shall be entered into only with the free and full consent of the intending spouses. And this is an absolutely critical and fundamental human right and a right that's echoed in multiple international conventions and treaties and which has been adopted completely uh, into Australian law. Many of us are such as Anti-Slavery Australia have an involvement with the Australian Government National Roundtable on Human Trafficking and Slavery and through that body um, there is a um, collaborative effort to address slavery and slavery-like practices. And that's why an organisation like Anti-Slavery Australia is involved in this area because of international law, forced marriage is considered to be such a serious violation of human rights and a crime against the person that it is a slavery-like practice. So forced marriage is a crime in Australia. It is considered to be an abuse, a form of exploitation that is so severe that it is a slavery-like practice. Um, this principle of human rights and, and respect for um, those in or at risk of forced marriage um, is absolutely critical and um, has been central in the development of the Australian Government National Action Plan to respond to um, slavery, slavery-like practices, including uh, forced marriage. Let's just look at um, the scope of forced marriage in the international context. And internationally and in Australia, it can be difficult to estimate the numbers of um, people who are affected by the factors of forced marriage. But in um, a major report produced by Plan International, uh, that organisation estimated that 14 million girls under the age of 18 are married each year around the world. You know, observing that statistic and also reflecting on the academic literature and anecdotal experience, it is clear um, that while most reported victims are young women and, or women and, and girls, they also boys and men, and that's certainly been the case in Australia too. Forced marriage can be an issue for members of the lesbian and gay community and for those members of the, of the Australian community who have a, a disability. So the framing of um, forced marriage in, in the Australian context is that it is a slavery-like practice. It is a severe violation of human rights, of humanity. And most recently we've seen um, credible reports of forced marriage as a form of violence against women and girls in crisis situations and in civil war. And these are the reports that we're seeing almost daily through through media. Well, what's happening 
thing in Australia. Firstly, um, we don't have um, many statistics about the Australian uh, um, about the, the demographic affected in Australia. But um, the AFP have reported um, that since forced marriage became a crime, there's been 49 referrals to the Australian Federal Police for forced marriage offences, and of that 49, um, the AFP are continuing to investigate 41. And the majority in this context are um, children under the age of 18. Um, there are a number of cases in, in the family law jurisdiction that really um, highlight something of um, the pattern of um, forced marriage in Australia. And I'll just refer to some of those cases now. Um, you'll be able to see a slide in front of you, and there are case names listed there. I'd like to, to note that these case names um, are not real names. Uh, they're just names that have been um, decided by, by the court. But just to mention one or two of these cases to illustrate something about the pattern of forced marriage in Australia. In the first case, um, Essie and Elia. This involved um, a report of um, a young girl of 14 who underwent um, a non-legally sanctioned marriage ceremony. So that is a marriage that took place outside the requirements of the Marriage Act of Australia. Um, she was, um, she explained, pushed to get married and really uh, deceived about what marriage meant. Um, but disturbingly, um, at this time, uh, she did tell a teacher at her school that there was a marriage um, pending, and there wasn't a, a response from the school. But I should make it clear: information about this case really comes to light, and that school teacher would have received that information about eight years ago. The response now from the school and from the school community, I believe, would be different. Disturbingly, uh, after the marriage, um, her education, but she told the court her husband stopped her going to school. She burned her homework and forced her to uh, leave school. If you don't drop out, I'll move you so far away that you won't ever see people. The case of Human Services and Vulcana also involved a 14-year-old girl um, who was anticipating going overseas to marry her 17-year-old fiancé. I should make it clear that in all these cases on the screen that you can see, um, those affected are Australian citizens. So in this case of Human Services and Vulcana, she was a 14-year-old girl. She stopped going to school. In this case, school teachers referred uh, her matter to Victorian Child Protection Services who investigated and there was an application to the court. And the court um, said that she, as a child, um, would not understand the significance of marriage and the court issued an injunction to prevent her from going overseas. Uh, in the case of Crease and Sampir, this involved a marriage that did take place in an overseas country. And in that case, the court decided to uh, void the marriage, or in other words, to cancel or to annul the marriage, because um, the woman in this case um, did not form a full and free consent, because the will to consent to the marriage had been overborne through the effects of coercion. The case of Nagri and Chapel involves the case of a man um, who was also subject to uh, a forced marriage in Australia. In this case, the coercion uh, that was exerted upon him that took away his free will was a coercion involving um, financial pressure and financial threat. And in that case, you know, the, the court also agreed that he had been, in effect, subject, subject to to forced marriage. But these cases took place before forced marriage became a criminal offence in Australia. But they do highlight something about 
um, the pattern of forced marriage in Australia. I'd like to say quite clearly that um, reports of forced marriage are, are absolutely not limited to any particular group, any particular ethnic, religious or cultural group. Our reports have been um, elucidated from many different communities and that's the experience um, in the uh, UK as well. Um, it's also important to say that the, the best framing we think in responding to forced marriage um, is to recognise that it is most often a form of violence against women and girls. It is a form of gender-based violence that takes place um, often uh, within, within families. So in very many ways, um, best practice responses in this area is really uh, in line with best practice responses uh, to uh, family violence and um, family violence within within families and and against um, girls and women. But in looking at the responses, um, it's really important that we do think about the evidence and make any comment based on what is known. Um, there can be some misunderstandings about forced marriage in the broader community, and there are certainly misunderstandings in the media. And you know the media reports on this issue are sensationalist and alarming and inaccurate and just have the effect of, of stigmatising communities. In March 2013, the Australian government um, passed legislation that made forced marriage in Australia a crime. The offence of forced marriage uh, was drafted after uh, a lot of community consultation and in response to a discussion paper that had been produced by the Australian Attorney General's Department. In responding to um, the issue of whether or not uh, a criminal response is the most desirable response, uh, perhaps um, it, is, it could be argued that there are other responses that would be that would be more um, suitable, given that, that this form of violence is something that occurs within um, families, the sensitive framing of family structures, um, gender, gender violence, references to patriarchal, patriarchal communities and um, community expectations, but perhaps criminalisation um, wasn't the best response, some, some commentators argued. Um, Anti-slavery Australia uh, supported the introduction of an offence, um, but in, in consort and in collaboration with communities so that the criminalisation would be one part of an offence of an effective response that would also include you know, meaningful consultation with communities, um, respect for initiatives that, are, that develop out of communities um, to ensure that uh, the human rights of people in or facing forced marriage are fully respected. But the Australian law, the offence of forced marriage in the Australian law, in the Commonwealth Criminal Code, says that it is an offence to cause a person to enter into a forced marriage or to be a party to a forced marriage. And a party to a forced marriage means agreeing to marry somebody that you know or suspect is a victim of forced marriage unless you are also the victim yourself. There are very serious offences, uh, penalties associated with forced marriage, and you can see that um, there is four years or seven years imprisonment, which is part of the, the current law, uh, if an offence is proved in a, in a criminal court. And sometimes those offences and the penalties uh, can be greater if the, the victim of the forced marriage is a child. There is a proposal um, to expand the definition of forced marriage to make it clear that um, there will be a criminal offence of forced marriage if a person under the age of 16 marries um, without the opportunity to um, address the presumption that they haven't consented. I'll just say that in another way. Um, 
the, the proposal to, to amend the law is that it's assumed that um, children under the age of 16 cannot consent to the marriage, um, but they can present evidence to the court that shows that they did have the capacity to fully and freely consent. So this is what's called a rebuttable presumption. And there's also a proposal before the uh, Australian Parliament to increase the offences of forced marriage to seven years and nine years for the aggravated offence. So the aggravated offence is the offence that would include um, forced marriage of a child, for example. Now, this is relevant because um, the forced marriage offences um, apply to a range of marriages uh, including those that take place um, under the Marriage Act of Australia, and I'll come back to that in a moment. They do cover marriages that are not legally sanctioned marriage ceremonies. So this is it. A forced marriage is a marriage entered into without the full and free consent of one or both of the people affected as a result of coercion, threat, or deception. And this applies to legally married recognised marriages as well as cultural or religious ceremonies and registered relationships. It, regard, it applies regardless of the age, gender or sexual orientation of a victim. Let's just have a look at what is meant by coercion, threats and deception. Now, coercion in um, everyday language means putting some kind of pressure on a person so that they feel they have no choice but to get married. Now, in legal language, this is sometimes referred to as, you know, the will is overborne. They don't have the capacity to form a full and free consent because of some kind of pressure that's been put on them. There's been a development of the law over the years, and you know, it's absolutely um, clear that the pressure um, can include um, Non-violent pressure, uh, such as um, controlling, very controlling um, coercion on on the part of some um, parents, perhaps. And in the court, this is um, a subject subjective test, so it's what the actual victim or the survivor would would explain about the impact of coercion. Threats um, would include physical violence. Um, actually inflicted on a person, such as being hit or um, falsely imprisoned, or the threat of violence. And deception includes tricking a person about the nature of the marriage or what the, the marriage ceremony is. So within the Australian context, um, forced marriages apply to marriages that take place in Australia that take place outside Australia if the conduct that leads to the forced marriage is by an Australian citizen or resident. And the forced marriage offences apply to legally recognised marriages, that's marriages in the, enacted in accordance with the Marriage Act, as well as cultural or religious ceremonies and, re and registered relationships. And the offences would involve um, or would include victims regardless of their age, gender or sexual orientation. Now it's important to always distinguish between uh, arranged marriages and sham marriages. Arranged marriages are completely legal in the Australian context, it's legal around the world. And they're quite simply marriages that are really um, arranged or organised through um, family connections. So it could be parents who are introducing children to each other in the hope that they may form a connection and decide to marry. It could be friends introducing couples to each other because they think they might like each other and might eventually marry. It is just a marriage that's organised through some kind of connection. It's absolutely fundamental though that the choice lies with the man and the woman affected, so that they do have the ability to decline the marriage or to accept it. 
So a, a marriage must be entered into with the full and free consent by both of the parties. And if the marriage is arranged and if they both agree fully and freely, then that's absolutely fine and completely legal. Sometimes um, marriages are sham marriages and these are not us usually considered um, forced marriages. Yeah, but they are where there is some kind of fake claim that a marriage is genuine for a benefit and often um, for uh, migration benefits, in which case one party um, says, I'm going to pay you X amount of money to marry me, pretend you're in a genuine relationship, you'll get the money and I'll get the visa. So that's a sham marriage, it's a fraudulent claim of a genuine relationship for a benefit. Um, sometimes um, there might be uh, an interconnection between a forced marriage and a sham marriage and this could take place um, where a marriage has been organised by traffickers where there is uh, an intention to exploit one of the parties. And there's been um, some research by the Australian Institute of Criminology that, that says that this could be uh, an issue in some cases involving partner migration. And one of the cases um, that went to court in Australia that did involve slavery offences did have an element of a sham marriage uh, as, as, as one of the aspects of that marriage. It's also important to um, distinguish between um, forced marriage, arranged marriage, sham marriage and servile marriage. And it's just a terminology issue but Servile marriage has a very particular and very limited meaning and it really just refers to um, cases that would fall within a, a 1956 slavery convention where a woman is treated as a piece of property, where she doesn't have the um, right to refuse a marriage or where she's been inherited by somebody or, or given to somebody. So this is a very limited um, form of marriage although it could take place in Australia. Um, sometimes we use the phrase servile marriage to refer more generally to situations where um, people in Australia are exploited in a labour context. But within the Australian criminal framework, um, such exploitation might be slavery or servitude or forced labour. But we don't have a specific offence of forced marriage. I'm here to speak um, very briefly about. Um, some of the um, stories that go to illustrate um, coercion and these come from um, the UK context. I spoke about some Australian um, cases earlier that went to court but this is, these are examples from the UK that do indicate the, uh, the subtlety of, of coercion. So in the first case of Marina, uh, she explains that she was isolated. Um, she was caught between her feelings and the community's expectations. She felt she would dishonour her family if she didn't go ahead with the marriage. And in Sola's case, um, she says that she was isolated. She had a disability because she was deaf. Um, and she also um, didn't have the ability to fully and freely consent to the marriage. Um, in Australian law, um, the Marriage Act, says that uh, marriageable age is 18. In some cases, uh, children aged 16 and 17 can marry if the court and the children's parent agrees and if only one of the couples under 18. And of course, there are also child protection legislation in each of the states and territories. Just thinking about some of the warning signs and indicators of forced marriage, I think that when you look at this list, you'll think that these kinds of indicators could apply to many forms of harm or you know, they really uh, are alerts that could indicate many forms um, or, or many issues that, that could raise concerns about a child's well-being or a person's well or an adult's well-being. So in the context of children, perhaps they're not going to school. Um, there's been a change in their school performance. Um, there might be health issues. 
Importantly, uh, within the family, within the fourth marriage literature, we see that um, if there's been a sibling in the family who's been forced to marry, that can be a, a very powerful indicator that there may be a forced marriage um, that could explain, um, that could raise uh, a warning that there might be a risk of forced marriage. And these other kinds of indicators might also um, be present. So I guess um, the message would be for all of us who work with um, with those who are vulnerable, children and adults, that um, where there are uh, warning signs and indicators that indicate um, that well-being isn't optimal, that forced marriage may be you know, one of the range of harms that, uh, that might be considered. Um, the effects of forced marriage are, are really um, very serious and you can see here that forced marriage is a slavery-like practice and, and these consequences that are listed here on this slide, on this slide you know, also apply to any person you know, who's been in, uh, in, a, in a situation of slavery or um, servitude in Australia. So a person who is experiencing forced marriage is severely impacted. You know, their human rights are, are affected. Um, they really um, do have uh, a need for um, for support and and for 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 uh, for a lot of support so that they can um, respond themselves within a within a good human rights framework. So what I'd like to talk about a bit now is is some of the framework that's developed and and to say again uh, what I said at the beginning which is that the best practice response to forced marriage in the Australian context is still developing. We, we want you to get involved um, in, in, in forging this response and one way you can do that is to connect with organisations who are um, working in this space. And one of those networks is the Forced Marriage Network in New South Wales and Victoria. Uh, the Red Cross is convening the Victorian network and anti-slavery and Red Cross convene the New South Wales network. Now although these are convened by these organisations, the, the terms of reference and the structure for the forced marriage network is based on um, grassroots organisation and is participatory. So each of the forced marriage networks has working groups addressing prevention, direct services, best practice and education and these are groups that are located in communities and these initiatives are developed out of communities. So try and connect with the Fourth Marriage Networks if you can. Find out more information um, from, by contacting Anti-Slavery Australia or the Red Cross or by emailing me. So the key is um, collaborative departments, um, partnerships, um, you know, working properly with communities, this is not and should not ever be a top-down approach. It's to really respectfully engage with a whole range of communities so that our organisations can work out what is the best prevention strategy and response in their community. And in designing these responses, you know, we are looking at best practice and doing, um, you know, designing a response that is completely respectful of the needs of survivors, uh, that does respect um, the vulnerability of survivors and does provide really sustained and effective support. Now collaboration is the key. Um, there are other resources that are available. One of those is the Australian Attorney General's Department Forced Marriage Community Pack and there's information on this slide about how you can access that pack. It was a collaborative exercise. We were on the uh, working party that developed this material and, and all the other organisations that I've mentioned were also parties here. So this, this is a, a useful resource and one that I you know, encourage you to have a look at. So thinking about referral pathways. Um, these are, this is a work in progress. I think that we recognise that those who are at risk 
or in a forced marriage have multiple multiple needs, you know, including housing, money, medical help, legal needs, education and counselling. Clearly, um, you are all, um, I've seen that, you know, just a description that many of you who are participating in this seminar today are involved in, in community responses, in, in the health sector, community sector and in the legal sector. I mean, and you are also based across Australia. You would be familiar with the mandatory reporting requirements in your state. Of course, across Australia, if we're ever fearful that there is an emergency, that a person is at risk of harm, triple uh, O is the first response. The Australian Federal Police does have a human trafficking team that is specialising in uh, slavery and slavery-like offences, including forced marriage, and you can contact them. You could also contact 1800 RESPECT. Anti-Slavery Australia um, can be contacted too and uh, we'd encourage, encourage that contact with you. In thinking about developing standards that operate across the sector, um, one of the initiatives that we worked on um, through the National Roundtable was to develop guidelines for NGOs working with trafficked people. And these were kind of intended to be a set of overriding principles. All of us um, have different um, professional frameworks where community workers, counsellors, psychologists, lawyers, we all have professional responsibilities. But these um, NGO guidelines were intended to distill the elements of professional practice that cut across all of our um, areas of, of professional practice. So it's worth having a look at these guidelines. They are in the process of being updated and I would expect the 2015 version will be available um, within weeks. But um, do have a look at these and the 2015 version will have some material on uh, forced marriage included. Now we have also got material of Anti-Slavery Australia and you can contact us if you would like uh, multilingual material. And I've listed the uh, languages that this material is available in on, on this slide. Um, we also have a little um, fold out leaflets that are great for school age um, people, flyers and reception posters. And this is all multilingual. If you'd like to have any of this, um, please, please contact us. And we've only had the um, printed versions for the last few weeks, but we've sent out thousands of them already as a result of um, requests. We've got um, a very exciting initiative, which is the, uh, a dedicated website um, on forced marriage that we will be launching on the 25th of November this year. Um, this will be launched on the day, or the International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And this website is called My Blue Sky, My Future. Not called Anti-Slavery Australia, it's called My Blue Sky. And this is a website that will be a national portal for information and help across Australia. Uh, it will include referral information, there will be multilingual material there, but importantly it will be um, an entry point for legal advice and representation. Uh, there will be uh, an exit button that's available on the screen that will um, um, allow a person to quickly leave the site and you know, destroy any evidence that that site has been accessed. We are expanding this um, service directory now. If you'd like to be included, please let us know. Now, down, just have a look at the um, little image at the bottom of the slide. See the see the my blue sky image. That the aesthetic that we've been uh, working on with the designers. So, you know, it's meant to be um, an optimistic, engaging site. We haven't included bars, we haven't included oppressive images. It's meant to be positive and it will include um, material, um, you know, that is written in a way um, that will, you know, engage and inspire rather than terrify. Uh, we are um, in the final weeks, as you can tell, of um, settling this. So, you know, if you'd like to know more about this now, please um, contact us. 
We've also got an anti-slavery Australia and e-learning platform. You can access this through our website, antislavery.org.au, and there is a specific module on that website that deals with forced marriage. You might be interested to have a look at that too. Now, um, there is an upcoming event um, that you might be interested in if you're in Adelaide, Melbourne, or Sydney, and I've included details about that event here. Asinda Sangara is a UK survivor of forced marriage and she will be speaking particularly about honour violence within the context of forced marriage. So you might like to register for those events. Um, finally, um, I think that you know we what we're trying to do is to um, respond to forced marriage with a range of our community partners and taking into account um, the needs and the opinions of providers. This is a step-by-step -step process. You know, there is not a template that is top-down. It's a process that um, you know, honestly engaging um, with with communities and and with vulnerable people. And this is something that's developing. So, if you'd like to contact us. Again, we'd um, really love to engage with you. What I would like to do um, in closing is just um, show you um, a short film animation that was developed in the UK. Um, I know that 1800 Respect is developing um, a poster that will be available in the Australian context, and I'm sure that there'll be more about that later either today or through the 1800 communication pathways. But I'd like you to, to have a look at this short animation. And, um, and it has been you know, helpful for us you know, as we've been um, framing uh, our approach to, to developing uh, information for, for community workers and for others affected. So if you'd like more information about what we do, about the legal response, uh, or anything at all you know, in this area, please contact us. This has obviously been um, a very short overview, and I've really um, taken up a lot of time. Um, and I'd love to talk more. So please, please do um, keep in touch. And I look forward to answering any questions that I can answer after you've seen this video. And thank you so much for the, opp for the opportunity. Here we go. Oh, hello. I'm not sure. Can you still hear me? I can't. I can't see the video playing. So should we go to questions now? Yep, that'll be good. Um, okay. Do you, do you think can do you think people can hear me now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think we can.
Yeah. I just wanted to say I can see that there's lots of questions. I'd be, and I'm very happy to answer these um, after if, if we can't get to all of them now. Okay. Is the video completed? It looks like yes, it has. The video is finished. The video is finished. Okay. So here from Timek saying, what are the statistics about forced marriages, which are not arranged marriages? Are they are they are they common? Okay. We don't really have any clear uh, or reliable information on how common forced marriages are in Australia. Um, what we do have is an indication. Uh, we do have some uh, material from the family court that speaks about um, case applications that have been made to the court. And we've also got the statistics from the Australian Federal Police that say that since March 2013, they've had 49 referrals for forced marriage type um, situation and of those they're continuing to investigate 41. So we don't have uh, we don't have complete information by any means in the Australian context. And you know, research um, is an important element of developing uh, a really effective response. And this is something that is ongoing and necessary. Great. We have another question here, Jennifer. Um, asking uh, what are the attitudes and responses effects on the forcing side, spouses and families? So why do families um, enter into a forced marriage? There are, there are many reasons and I think that I think it's important when we're thinking about this we don't uh, demonise families and demonise communities. But the international um, research says that you know, families might be uh, concerned about a child's future. They are seeking financial security or social security for their child. They might be trying to, um, to, to, to support the child um, because there might be um, an element of, of disability. Sometimes there are reports, uh, particularly from the UK um, research, that um, community expectations, uh, expectations and perceptions of of religion or community uh, might be at play here. But uh, there are many, there are many and diverse reasons why um, forced marriage may be um, compelled on an unwilling person. Right. And uh, another question: Where do you get the guidelines for NGOs, Doc? Okay, these are available on the uh, Australian Attorney General's website, um, ag.gov.au. And it's that website that you can look at as well, which would give you um, the, the Attorney General's community pack about forced marriage. And that um, pack includes information on the safety plan. Um, it's got information on risk factors, um, responses, referral information, and there's also a, a section of the community pack that deals with language and gives uh, information for, for media. So it's definitely worth having a look at that uh, community pack on the Attorney General's website. Great. And I think we've got time for just one final question now, Jennifer, which is in relation to the proposed changes to the legislation, where are these changes at? That's a really good question, um, and you know, they, the changes are part of a bill that deals with a whole lot of other issues. You know, they went; they're basically at the House of Representatives, waiting to get listed uh, for debate and discussion. And you know, I would hope that that would happen sooner rather than later. I did contact uh, Parliament House last week to ask them about that, but there was no information about the timeline, about when those um, changes would be considered by the Parliament. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, for your presentation today. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. A special thank you for the people that have submitted questions. And if there are any questions that were missed out today, please remember to contact Jennifer via email. Um, finally, I'd like to mention that uh, we will have another webinar in December, so stay tuned. The best way about 
to keep informed about our upcoming webinars is to ensure that you subscribe to our newsletter or visit our website under the, first, uh, the Workers and Professionals portal. I'm also very excited to announce that in November, in, in line with the International Day of the Elimination of Violence Against Women, 1-800-RESPECT will launch a Frontline Workers Toolkit. And to access or to get any more information about accessing this toolkit, uh, please, please ensure also that you subscribe to our newsletter or you can go to 1-800-RESPECT.org.au forward slash toolkit. Um, finally now, um, I, um, please stay on the line because if you stay logged in, we'd like you to take our online survey which will be redirected to you now. And finally, thanks again. Thank you for your participation, your questions and your feedback and we wish you a very good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you everybody. And remember, I'm, I'm really happy to continue to answer any questions um, over the email if you want to send anything in. Jennifer.burn at uts.edu.au.